So, evening everybody wants a fall. That's very echoey, isn't it? Sounds like we're in a swimming pool. That's better? Testing, testing, te That's okay, isn't it? Great. Thanks very much for coming to... Thanks very much to... Funny, isn't it? Hello, hello, hello. That's better. It's a bit tinny, isn't it? Tinny. Sorry, Joe, to give you so much trouble. <laughs> How's that now? That better? That's all right. Um, thanks very much for coming tonight, especially in the middle of the Christmas rush, which is more extraordinary and sort of feverish, I think, this year than I ever remember. <laughs> I don't know about you, but everyone seems to be rushing in all directions, spending vast sums of money. Uh, and I'm probably not getting an awful lot of joy out of it at the moment, I think. Maybe later they will. So, uh, we're going to do today uh, question four and answer four. Uh, so, you remember the last question and answer we did, question and answer three, uh, Nichiren Daishonin was explaining to the traveller, uh, Hojo Tokiori, as he really is, the ruler of Japan, why it is absolutely essential for him, uh, since he's the most powerful in Japan, man in Japan, to admonish those who are following or teaching, preaching, distorted or incomplete teachings. And of course he's referring specifically to Buddhism in a Buddhist country. That is to say, the teachings of those times, of the various sects, were in one way or another totally uh, ignoring the true meaning of the Lotus Sutra or even ignoring the Lotus Sutra in its entirety uh, despite the fact that Shakyamuni said it was his supreme teaching for the age of Mapo and secondly uh, of course through this allowing people to be misled and to follow teachings which were in fact breed breeding actually encouraging apathy and people's resignation to their lot uh, which of course is doing nothing else but sap their life force. So Japan, you could say, was lost in, the, in those times in a great sea of apathy and negativity. Incredible thought, isn't it, when you go to Japan today, it's so dynamic and mostly very forward-going. In those times, they were lost in a sea of misery. And of course, uh, at the same time, this left uh, the devilish force of life to work freely uh, and the three calamities and seven disasters arose in all directions and one upon the other. Unfortunately, so far as the Risho Ron is concerned, the traveller uh, looks increasingly on Nichiren Daishonin's explanation of the problem uh, as being a personal affront which, of course, it was. He was the, the, the ruler of Japan behind the scenes. So, inevitably, as a person with such immense power, he would take any criticism of the state of Japan, the people's lives there, directly to his own heart. Uh, and I think this is probably would be the reaction of many people of influence in society, wouldn't it? Uh, when the time comes, and society begins to change and they find what they've been teaching, preaching, writing about undermined, inevitably they're going to get as indignant and angry as the traveller. So this is how what's known as the three strong enemies inevitably arise at some point in the movement for Kosen Rufu. Does everyone know the three strong enemies? First one being uh, people of influence in society who turn against Buddhism and because they have influence for, for instance writers broadcasters uh, people who are popular on television those sort of people uh, have great influence on the minds of people that's the first of the strong enemies the second of the strong enemies is ignorant priests who misunderstand the purity of Nichiren Daishonin's teachings in the movement for Kosen Rufu and turn people against it. And the third one is the ruling authorities turning against it, probably through the influence of the first two, priests of other religions 
or uh, influential people of one sort or another. So, uh, in a sense, uh, the, the indignant traveller represents, in a way, the beginnings of the three strong enemies, or he could easily turn into such. So, let's have a look, at, first of all, at question four, which is quite short, and John will read it. It's on page 16 at the bottom. <clears throat> you all got it? Page 16. The guest, growing more indignant than ever, said, A wise monarch, by acting in accord with heaven and earth, perfects his rule. A sage, by distinguishing between right and wrong, brings order to the world. The monks and priests of the world today enjoy the confidence of the entire empire. If they were in fact evil monks, then the wise ruler would put no trust in them. If they were not true sages, then men of worth and understanding would not look up to them. But now, since worthies and sages do in fact honour and respect them, they must be nothing less than paragons of their kind. Why then do you pour out these wild accusations and dare to slander them? To whom are you referring when you speak of evil monks? I would like an explanation. So, of course, Hojo Tokiori himself uh, had uh, taken holy orders or the equivalent, even though he was still a layman, uh, he, was, he had taken uh, the vows of a monk. So perhaps uh, the traveler or Hojo really thought the Nichiren Daishonin was great, getting directly at him, which, of course, he was. So let's have a look at this, and perhaps the two uh, most important first points are uh, Nichiren Daishonin referring to a wise monarch who acts in accord with heaven and earth and perfects his rule, and a sage, by distinguishing between right and wrong, brings order to the world. So first of all, thinking about wise monarchs who act in accord with heaven and earth. That is to say, uh, a king or a queen who can live in harmony with the workings of the universe. That is heaven and uh, in harmony with nature or earth, which is the environment. So certainly they would have to be extremely wise. And truly one finds very few such monarchs or leaders of society, leaders of government in all of history who've done that. Probably in the East, the only two examples are uh, King Ashoka of India and Prince Shotoku of Japan. But on the other hand, of course, they were nothing else but followers of the Buddha. So uh, in the West, extremely difficult to find. The only thing I could think about, sort of pondering about it when I was preparing this lecture, was really going back to, the, to legend and to the stories in the Bible of King Solomon and David, uh, both of whom were supposed to be extremely wise, though David was quite naughty at times. Uh, certainly, I can think of no one in English or British history uh, who was truly a wise monarch in the sense of being in harmony with heaven and earth. Uh, although King Canute did his best, didn't he, when he tried to stop the tide from coming in and miserably failed. You all know the story of King Canute, I imagine. It's still st taught in schools. <laughs> Anyone doesn't know about King Canute, I'm rather interested to know. King Canute, wow, that's amazing. King Canute was always one of the great stories when you first started to learn history. Uh, but he was uh, a Danish king of England, and uh, in those days, of course, the monarch was supposed to have divine rule. He, he, ru he ruled by, by God and God's agreement. And so the barons and lords of those days questioned whether King Canute had such ability and such power. And so he, stupid man, <laughs> ordered his throne to be moved down to the beach, uh, somewhere on the south coast, I believe, or was it the east coast? And... Uh, uh, he said that he would prove to them that he was an absolute king by divine right by telling the tide to stop coming in and it would obey. And sadly, 
uh, he failed and the water was washing around his ankles before he knew where he was. So I think that's uh, probably a good example of wisdom or lack of it amongst monarchs. <laughs> the democracies, I'm being unkind there, there have been some very fine monarchs, but whether there have been really, truly wise ones in terms of living in harmony with heaven and earth, I somewhat doubt, don't you? So uh, today, of course, monarchy is represented by government, statesmen, politicians. <laughs> Even worse, isn't it? Uh, they are often very well-intentioned people. Please don't think I'm just knocking them down in a general sense. Of course not. They're often very well-intentioned people. Uh, sometimes they're not, but mostly I believe they are. But they're not wise in that sense, are they? And the reason for sure is that they completely lack uh, a sound philosophy or a rock on which to base their thinking and their actions. Uh, they lack wisdom in that sense. And because of that, they get pulled this way and that all the time by the pressures of politics, both domestic politics and international politics. Uh, likewise, because of this, because of the incredible pressures on them, uh, I think they're very often divorced from uh, the real needs of the people. The pressures of maintaining a political system and winning the next election are the most important things, aren't they? So uh, it isn't really until just before an election that a truly humane thing is usually promised. And then after the election, it fails to get carried out. So this sounds very scathing, but sadly, it's uh, often true. So, of course, compared with that, can one imagine a monarch in terms of uh, government leaders or statesmen who have the gods? It's just an amazing thought, isn't it? Thinking how one, we've all changed since we started to practice, the thought of a statesman who has the bonds, or a prime minister, or a foreign minister, they're bound to be somewhat different, aren't they? Certainly, they would be doing their struggling with all their might to base their actions on the rhythm of life, on, on the rhythm of nam myoho renge And certainly, they would develop compassion and perception and would therefore inevitably care about the people and their needs. Also, they would understand through that perception the currents and the trends of life. They bring themselves to be able to make realistic sort of 20-year plans, feeling the rhythm of the times, which is impossible at the moment for them. And also, of course, they'd be able to perceive where the devilish force of life is at work and take appropriate steps to defeat it. So once it's almost difficult to take into one's mind, isn't it, thought of a number of statesmen actually basing their actions on the mystic law. But one day, for sure, it must happen. So I, I remember in 1980, when I first did the Risho Ankoko Ron lectures, I asked at that time who, I wondered, would be the first politician of Myoho, the first politician to chant Nam Myoho Ringlikyo. Still hasn't happened. I really hope it'll happen one day soon. Certainly, whoever it is is going to be, uh, have a tough time at the beginning, because their views will be so often uh, different and unique, uh, and they'll have to struggle with their fellow MPs to make them understand. But because of the pure wisdom of what they say, in the end, they're going to win. So certainly, you wouldn't find the first Sokogakai International, Nishun Shoshu, politician in this country uh, on the extreme left or the extreme right. They're unlikely to be Trotskyists or fascists uh, because that's not in the nature of Buddhism. But they could very easily be either on the right or the left of center. They may be either. Uh, and it doesn't matter indeed if they're on both right and left of center as long as all their actions are working towards uh, establishing the truth, the ultimate truth of the Gonson in politics. So what matters is the result. 
And uh, even today in our discussion meetings or various committees, we may sometimes argue about how is the best way to do activities. Just because we all practice to the gods and doesn't seem mean to say that we all agree immediately that the best day to have the chapter friendship day is the 20th of April. Other people may say no, the 26th. Other people may be disappointed and so on. So, but in the end they come to the right answer that's best for everybody. So discussion is very important. Uh, even about a marriage, since his guidance has always said, he's always said, there must be some abrasion, but on the other hand there shouldn't be too much. Some abrasion in a marriage is essential between the couple, because otherwise they'd never create anything, would they? They'd be uh, sort of stagnant and rather useless if they agreed with each other all the time. So, same thing in politics. There should be some abrasion, because it's out of discussion, isn't it, uh, that you bring forth, or you should do, people's ideas and indeed their wisdom. It's the very battle of that discussion, maybe, which makes you go back to the Gahonzan to prove to yourself that your idea that you put forward was right, or perhaps you find it was wrong. So definitely, they may be on either side of that center line of politics in the future. So much for monarchs, what about sages? Where are the sages in this world? Let's think. Do we see any around readily sages, men of great, incredible wisdom? So as I was saying in that last public le lecture about education, we live in an age, unfortunately, of specialization. That is to say, uh, people are dropped into a stream in our education system at a young age when they're not really ready to make any judgment about what they want to do in the future. And circumstances or the environment, if you like, of the educational system and the economic system keep them in that stream, probably right the way through for the rest of their lives, unless they're very, very adventurous. The reason for that is often economics, isn't it? Because, okay, because uh, the easiest way to earn the best money, obviously, is to go into a job which you've specialized to do. Therefore, people find from an economic point of view that they tend to follow that stream continuously and therefore know very little about what's going on beyond their own particular little ditch. So this is why we lack, you know, men of great minds. There definitely is a lack. We've been trying a long time and asking all sorts of different people uh, who ought to know about whether there are such great men in existence or up-and-coming great men so that perhaps one day they might be able to hold a dialogue with Sensei. But never yet has anyone come up with a really solid answer. People are specialists. They've gone. Perhaps one of the last was Professor, uh, Professor Toynbee, Dr. Toynbee. He had a huge mind. And this was because of his upbringing and, of course, his own capabilities and abilities. But after he went through university, he spent so long developing his understanding of all sorts of other dis different aspects of life. Not only life in this country, but also in countries overseas, such as China and Greece and so on. Life and the civilizations that have existed in the past. And his mind was, could take in the whole world and not one narrow aspect of it. So I think today we do definitely find that scholars, not all of them of course, but m most scholars also are specialists they're specializing in some particular narrow field. So in a way, all their studies are for study's sake, aren't they? They're really, uh, they're really uh, developing their ego, their position in life, based on that very narrow field. Uh, so again, we might say, who's going to be the first great Dr. Toynbee of NSUK? There must be one somewhere. I don't mean that he'll necessarily be an expert in history, 
but definitely somewhere, probably out of the members we even have at this moment, some incredible great scholar is going to appear. I really hope so, don't you? And he'll set the pace, and his wisdom is bound to have a great effect on whatever particular aspect of life uh, he challenges. So these are exciting things to come. Sensei, when he was giving uh, his lecture on the, the, this particular question in the Risho An uh, pointed out that uh, so long as our leaders, our social leaders, are narrow in outlook, uh, inevitably uh, they will not understand the rhythm of the times. They will not understand the needs of the people. And therefore, uh, the people will become stifled. Society itself will become stifled because the leaders haven't got a broad enough nine mind to grasp what their needs are now and in 10 years' time and 20 years' time. And of course, this leads to apathy and frustration, doesn't it? So he said, if the, uh, really uh, basing this on the famous quotation in On Attaining Buddhahood, if the minds of society's leaders are impure, the minds of the people will become impure, and therefore their land will also be impure. So impure in the sense, of course, of either of the three poisons. Ignorance as to the true trends in life, the true uh, needs of the people in life, uh, arrogance in the form of believing that they're the only ones who know anything about that particular aspect of life, uh, and perhaps even greed in that they want to make themselves famous. So this is a serious matter, isn't it? If the minds of society's leaders are impure, that is to say, egotistical or conceited, the minds of the people are bound to become impure because they don't understand the needs of the people or provide for them, which in turn gives rise to anger, frustration in the hearts of the people. And therefore also the land will become impure through, of course, the principle of Eshofuni. So we too have to think of this as leaders. It's also very important that our minds should grow big and wide and high. That we also can feel the trends of the times. Because unless we can do that, we find we'll stifle our members. We don't do activities now in exactly the same way we did them 10 or 12 years ago even. And in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years time, it will not be appropriate or suitable to do activities in the way we're doing them now. When the Gakkai was first formed, they gave guidance in a way, personal guidance, in a way which they would never dream of giving to members nowadays. Those were chaotic times. Japan was destroyed. People, people's possession and properties were in ruins. They were poverty-stricken. Therefore, they would accept incredible, strong, direct guidance. Really tough stuff, because they had to break out of that negativity and win. They needed a colossal jerk to be able to do it. But you couldn't speak to people in Japan today in the same way. Definitely personal guidance. Of course, the principles of the guidance remain the same based on the Gosho, but the way guidance is given has to be different. Likewise, of course, it has to be very different from uh, here in this country, from the way they do it in Japan. So we definitely have to develop and maintain broad, open minds and feel the trends of the time through taking an interest in everything that goes on. So uh, I was never terribly fond of the newspapers, but since I became uh, a leader for Kosen Rufu, I make a point of reading the papers 
regularly so that I can keep abreast with what's going on in society. It's extremely important. Likewise, we should read books on all sorts of subjects. Novels, anything you like. Because they're all giving us an idea or a feel of the nature of the times, aren't they? So Sensei reads many different sorts of books. And that's right. All books, if you like, have something valuable to teach you if you really approach them with such a mind about the way of society at the moment and the trend which may develop in the future. So we have to think of that carefully ourselves, otherwise our minds could even become soggy and stagnant and impure. So why this, the, why this is so uh, is, of course, because of that narrow view of life. And this comes from, in the terms of society, of course, from the lack of a solid philosophy, rock on which to base everything. So what do, do, what do the leaders of society do to compensate for the fact that they haven't got the wisdom to be able to go with the people, as it were, and really understand them. Of course, this isn't a conscious thing. Probably they think they understand the people very well. But what they have to develop, and history proves this, is either a moral code, a code of conduct, or, or I should say, and a bleak stroke, or more and more rigid laws and bureaucratic control in order to control the people rather than being able to go with them. Of course laws, civil laws, are always necessary but they should be kept to the minimum, shouldn't they? But because these leaders may feel they're losing control over the people the natural thing they turn to is more and more laws, legislation, more and more bureaucratic control to try to keep control and power over them. So, of course, there are tons of examples in history of that in the past thousand years or more. And the terrible thing is, of course, moral codes, laws, when there are too many of them and they're petty and interfering, they just encourage people to break them. So it leads to the beginnings of a sort of uh, rebellious movement against it. So you can think of a few examples of that. In the Victorian era, the moral code of Christianity was very strongly propagated. But uh, the Victorian era is also known as an age of hypocrisy because actually people behind the scenes were always breaking these laws. And this rigid control of those Victorian times has actually resulted, the outcome of it, is the permissiveness of society today. So, though it may be difficult for some of you who are young to believe, but this permissiveness began during World War I. It's a long time ago now. And it arose, it was a rebellion, not only against that war, but also against the society that had allowed such a war to occur. And this rebellion then developed into what was called the Roaring Twenties uh, and gradually uh, developed until World War II occurred, which accelerated even further, leading directly to the permissiveness which gradually appeared in the 50s and 60s. So this is how that arose in direct response to the moral code of the Victorians. Very interesting, isn't it? Likewise, of course, um, the age of the Commonwealth, the, of the Puritans and Oliver Cromwell and Roundheads and Cavaliers and all that, the Puritan regime was followed by the era begun by King Charles II, which was extremely loose and somewhat licentious. So there's always this humanity moving from one extreme to another. So an example of rigid laws and bureaucratic control uh, this of course 
always leads to suppression, as I said, and therefore to outbursts of violence, probably, and riots against it. Uh, submission, in other words, is not a palatable thing for people. And at some point, someone will always break out. So Jesus Christ's rebellion was against, actually, the incredible, interfering, uh, petty rules and laws of conduct of the Jewish race, of Judaism, of the Torah, as it's called. This is what he rebelled against, really, in the form of a religious revolution. So those rules and regulations, you know, were unbelievable. If you read some of the uh, books of the Old Testament, you can get an idea that every aspect of people's lives were controlled by these laws even when a man could make love to his wife or a wife could make love to the man, and so on. So uh, people rebelled against it and always will. And probably uh, we could begin to see the same thing happening in this country today. Due to suppression, uh, there are outbursts of rioting due to frustration. People feeling there's no outlet for them to move, especially young people. So definitely, we could say, couldn't we, that to produce wise monarchs or great sages, they need a great master or teacher. And we're so fortunate in that respect, in having found the Buddha, who can produce not only an incredible philosophy, but a practice which enables you more and more to live that philosophy. So this is really our good fortune. You see, even Shakyamuni's Buddhism, though it was extremely valuable for a thousand years, but even that in the end reverted to a sort of idol worship. Uh, although he said, please don't do it. And even Christianity, uh, which of course embraces also the Ten Commandments, and not worshipping any graven image, yet if you go to some churches, you'll find them full of images which people actually worship. So uh, the importance, therefore, the incredible thing which the Buddha did was to produce the Gohonzon, which is the perfect, absolute and constant object of worship. So however much, you know, one might try to search, I don't think uh, that these great monarchs or rather, let's call them leaders of society in modern terms, or great sages, are going to appear except through the power of the gods. This I firmly believe. So this is the way uh, our movement for Kosen Rufu has to unfold in the future, doesn't it? With uh, the men of influence more and more being people who have released the wisdom of their Buddhist state through the gods. Okay, so far? Let's go on to answer four, then. Answer four is rather long, so John can read it fairly briskly if we follow it in the books, okay? This is page 17. The host said, In the reign of Emperor Gotaba, there was a priest named Honen who wrote a work entitled the Senchakushu. He contradicted the sacred teachings of Shakyamuni and brought confusion to people in every direction. The Senchakushu states, the Chinese, Chinese priest Tao Chou distinguished between the Shodo, or sacred way teachings, and the Jodo, or pure land teachings, and urged men to abandon the former and immediately embrace the latter. First of all, there are two kinds of sacred way teachings, the Mahayana and the Hinayana. Judging from this, we may assume that the esoteric Mahayana doctrines of Shingon and the true Mahayana teachings of the Lotus Sutra are both included in the sacred way. If that is so, then the present-day sects of Shingon, Zen, Tendai, Keigon, Sanron, Hosso, Jiron, and Shoron, all these eight schools are included in the sacred way that is to be abandoned. The priest Tan Luan in his Ojo Ron Chu states, I note that Nagarjuna's Juju Babasha, Babasha Ron says, there are two ways by which the Bodhisattva may reach the state in which there is no retrogression. One is the difficult to practice way, the other is the easy to practice way. 
The difficult to practice way is the same as the sacred way, and the easy to practice way is the pure land way. Students of the pure land sect should first of all understand this point. Though they may previously have studied teachings belonging to the sacred way, if they wish to become followers of the pure land school, they must discard the sacred way and give their allegiance to the pure land teachings. Honen also says, the Chinese priest Shan Tao distinguished between correct and incorrect practices and urged men to embrace the former and abandon the latter. Concerning the first of the incorrect practices, that of reading and reciting sutras, he states that, with the exception of the recitation of the Kamurio Ju Sutra and the other Pure Land Sutras, the embracing and recitation of all sutras, whether Mahayana or Hinayana, exoteric or esoteric, is to be regarded as an incorrect practice. Concerning the third of the incorrect practices, that of worshipping, he states that, with the exception of worshipping the Buddha Amida, the worshipping or honouring or, or, of, or honoring of any of the other Buddhas, Bodhisattvas or deities of the heavenly and human worlds, is to be regarded as an incorrect practice. In the light of this passage, it is clear that one should abandon such incorrect practices and concentrate upon the practice of the Pure Land teaching. What reason would we have to abandon the correct practices of the Pure Land teaching which ensure that out of a hundred persons all one hundred will be reborn in the Western Paradise and cling instead to the various incorrect practices and procedures which could not save even one person in a thousand? Followers of the way should ponder this carefully. Honen further states, In the Jogen Nuzo Roku, we find it recorded that from the 600 volumes of the Daihanya Sutra to the whole Joju Sutra, the exoteric and the esoteric sutras of Mahayana Buddhism total 637 works in 2,883 volumes. All of these should now be replaced by the single recitation of the single Mahayana phrase, the Nembutsu. You should understand that when the Buddha was preaching according to the capacity of his various listeners, he for a time taught the two methods of concentrated meditation and unconcentrated meditation. But later, when he revealed his own enlightenment, he ceased to teach these two methods. The only teaching that, once revealed, shall never cease to be taught is the single doctrine of the Nembutsu. Again, Honen states, the passage which says that the practitioner of the Nembutsu must possess three kinds of mind is found in the Kamurioju Sutra. In the commentary on that sutra we read, someone asked, if there are those who differ in understanding and practice from the followers of the Nembutsu, persons of heretical and mistaken belief, how can one make certain that their perverse and differing views will not cause trouble? We also see that these persons of evil views, with their differing, un different understanding and different practices, are compared to a band of robbers who call back the travellers who have already gone one or two steps along their journey. In my opinion, when these passages speak of different understanding, different practices, varying doctrines and sacred, varying beliefs, they are referring to the teachings of the sacred way. Finally, in a concluding passage, Honan says, if one re wishes to escape quickly from the sufferings of life and death, one should confront these two superior teachings and then proceed to put aside the teachings of the sacred way and choose those of the pure land. And if one wishes to follow the teachings of the pure land, one should confront the correct and incorrect practices and then proceed to abandon all those that are incorrect and devote one's entire attention to those that are correct. When we <laughs> examine these passages, we see that Honen quotes the erroneous explanations of Tan Luan, Tao Cho, and San Tao, Shan Tao, and establishes the categories he calls sacred way and pure land, difficult to practice way and easy to practice way. He then takes all the 637 works in 2,883 volumes that comprise the Mahayana Sutras of the Buddha's lifetime, including those of the Lotus Sutra and Shingon, along with all the Buddhas, Bodhisattvas and deities of the heavenly and human worlds, and assigns them all to the sacred way, the difficult to practice way, and the incorrect practices categories, and urges men to discard, close, ignore, and abandon them. With these four injunctions, he leads all people astray. And on top of that, he groups together all the sage monks of the three countries of India, China, and Japan, as well as the students of Buddhism of the ten directions, directions and calls them a band of robbers, causing the people to insult them. In doing so, he turns his back on the passages of the three Pure Land Sutras, the sutras of his own sect, which contain Amida's vow to save everyone except those who commit the five cardinal sins or slander the true law. 
At the same time, he shows that he fails to understand the warning contained in the second volume of the Lotus Sutra, the most important sutra expounded in the five preaching, pe preaching periods of the Buddha's life, which reads, One who refuses to take faith in this sutra and instead slanders, slanders it, after he dies, he will fall into the hell of incessant suffering. And now, we have come to this later age, when men are no longer sages. Each enters his own dark road, and all alike forget the direct way. How pitiful that no one cures them of their blindness. How painful to see them vainly lending encouragement to these false beliefs. And as a result, everyone from the ruler of the nation down to the humblest peasant believers believes that there are no true sutras outside the three Pure Land Sutras and no Buddhas other than the Buddha Amida with his two attendants. Once there were men like Dengyo, Gishin, Jikaku and Chisho who journeyed 10,000 leagues across the waves to acquire the sacred teachings or visited all the mountains and rivers of Japan to acquire Buddhist statues which they held in reverence. In some cases, they built holy temples on the peaks of high mountains in which to preserve these, those scriptures and statues. In other cases, they constructed sacred halls in the bottoms of deep valleys where such objects could be worshipped and honoured. But as, as a result, the Buddhas Shakyamuni and Yakushi shone side by side, casting their influence upon present and future ages, while the Bodhisattvas Kokuzo and Jizo brought benefit to the living and the dead. The rulers of the nation contributed counties or villages so that the lamps might continue to burn bright before the images, while the stewards of the great estates offered their fields and gardens to provide for the upkeep of the temples. But because of this book by Honen, this Sen Chakushu, the Lord Buddha Shakyamuni is forgotten, and all honor is paid to Amida, the Buddha of the Western Land. The Lord Buddha's transmission of the law is ignored and Yakushi, the Buddha of the eastern region, is neglected. All attention is paid to the three works in four volumes of the Pure Land Scriptures and all the other wonderful teachings that Shakyamuni proclaimed throughout the five periods of his preaching life are cast aside. If temples are not dedicated to Amida, then people no longer have any desire to support them or pay honour to the Buddhas enshrined there. If monks do not chant the Nembutsu, then people quickly forget all about giving those monks alms. As a result, the halls of the Buddha fall into ruin. Scarcely a whip of, whiff, wisp of smoke rises above their mossy tiles, and the monks' quarters stand empty and dilapidated, the dew deep on the grasses in their courtyards. And in spite of such conditions, no one gives a thought to protecting the law or to restoring the temples. Hence, hence the sage monks who once presided over the temples leave and do not return and the benevolent deities who guarded the Buddhist teachings depart and no longer appear. This has all come about because of this Shen Chakushu of Honen. How pitiful to think that in the space of a few decades hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people have been deluded by these devilish teachings and in so many cases confused as to the true teachings of Buddhism. If people favor perverse doctrines and forget what is correct, can the benevolent deities be anything but angry? If people cast aside doctrines that are all-encompassing and take up those that are...